look at camera number two just a minute. I encourage those that are watching uh, in Africa to, you pastors, we taught on it this morning. I want you to serve communion to your, your students and also your congregation next Sunday morning in Jesus' name. All right? Thank you so much. God will honor you for that. Amen. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, please, and verse 8. Very familiar portion of Scripture here today. But I want to bring out a little nugget the Lord gave me. Everybody here can quote this, especially the Royces, right? You can quote it, right? Sure you can. Say it with me. For by grace are you saved through faith. Let not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Amen. If I could explain it this way, we're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, plus nothing. Now, that separates most of the religious crowd because they're, they're trusting in doing something to merit God's grace and favor, and it doesn't work that way. Amen. To repeat, we're saved through faith alone. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Say it with me. I'm saved by faith alone. Try it again. I'm saved by faith alone, through grace alone. I'm saved by faith alone, through grace alone. I need 100% cooperation. I'm saved by faith alone, through grace alone. Plus nothing. Why do I feel a snag there? Well, as long as we maintain faith, we're in good shape. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 5, part A, amen. Appreciate your faith in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Very precious. We are kept by the power of God through faith. Under salvation, our deliverance, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by the power of God through faith. Amen. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, please. Paul said this before he was uh, transferred to heaven, promoted. He said, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. What? I have kept the faith. Can I have an amen? amen. What does this mean? What is, what, what is the faith? We've got so many different concepts about what people think the faith is, and preachers are so messed up on this. But the faith is simply the truth regarding the meaning of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the faith is. Now, you must maintain that focus. And Satan wants to stray the church away uh, to another object of faith, and there cannot be any other object of faith. Jesus is the source. So then, if we're focused correctly and our faith is, is active, we will accept God's provisions. How many will accept God's provisions this year? Yes. He won't force you, but it's a good deal. And when we receive communion today, we're acknowledging that we're in covenant with God. Covenant. We're not going to break covenant. God cannot break covenant. We could, but we're not going to because we're in faith and grace. Amen. And then, of course, there's a little catch here. We need to pay our vows the first year, I think. How many have told the Lord last year, and we all have, Lord, I'm going to do this and that, and I'm going to, you know, and then we fall down and miss the mark sometimes. And uh, we just need to renew our commitment to the Lord today. Start this year off right. It's an individual thing. You must make that choice and commitment. I can't do it for you, but it needs to be done. For example, in Psalm 66 and verse 13, back in the writings of Psalms, he said, I will go into the house with burnt offerings. 
I will pay thee my vows. Now today, everybody, um, Jesus is our burnt offering. We don't bring a little lamb up here and burn the thing on the altar, no. Jesus is our, is our offering. Nevertheless, we need to pay our vows. That's right. Now, if you failed somewhere last year, I'm glad we're in grace because we can repent and God will forgive us every single time. Amen. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the covenant that we're in. We all mess up sometimes. We shouldn't, but we do, uh, unfortunately. However, as long as we keep up to date in our faith in Jesus, we can't lose. Uh, if there's any condemnation, it's Satan putting on you. God doesn't do it. For example, in Romans 8, verse 1 today, amen. Romans 8, 1, the Bible tells us, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The question is, how does a person get in Christ? Now, I've been teaching on that. As many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Yeah. I'm going to get it across to the Africans if it's the last thing I do. Because yeah. they think that's water. No, it's not water. Not water. Amen. Anyway, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation, period, Amen. to you. Now, you can condemn yourself in a thing that you allow, but if we're walking in the Word, how can we lose? See, to be led by the Spirit is to be walking in the confines of the Word. Right. Amen. Amen. So we maintain faith by simply staying in God's will. How many can do that this year? Please. I won't get so many gray hairs. <laughs> and you've got to submit to Scripture. You get to submit to the Scripture. If the Bible says this, there's two or three Scriptures to, to bear up a, a, a fact, then you must accept it as God's Word because it is God's Word. Amen. Forget the other versions. You don't need them. Right. So many people, oh, we can't understand the old King James. You get another version, you're more confused now than you were. Amen. Throw them away. Am I plain enough this year? Like one little lady said, well, bless the Lord, Jesus quoted the old King James, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Fact is, it wasn't around. <laughs> King James didn't come around until about 1611 or there about, all right? Anyway, God bless those saints. Amen. <laughs> but you know, it's easy to be saved if you accept God's way. Amen. But you can't add anything to what's been done. And if you do, what does Galatians chapter 5 and I think it's verse 4 say? We better take a look at this. Galatians 5, 4. Christ has become a no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So let's say we're, we're Christians today, and hopefully everyone is, born of the Spirit of God, named in the book of life, and the will of God, the best you know. But if you tack on a law to it, amen, for justification, you're going to fall from grace. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't have rules and principles that we need to live by, but not for justification. Right. We're justified by faith alone, through grace alone. <laughs> it, it's so simple that a child can understand it, but people have to get this religious nonsense out of their mind and get back to the simplicity of Christ. Paul was worried about that. Who's bewitched you? You need to read Galatians. In fact, we might teach on that, the whole book sometime. Scripture and verse. Here's a few things I jotted down that people try to do to save themselves. Well, they'll say, well, I'm ignorant. I don't understand. So God, I'm not accountable. Nope. They'll get into the denial and shift the blame. Well, it's not my fault. Someone else's, you know. No, nope, it won't work. They'll say, I've heard this. God loves me and understands my sinfulness. Oh, he loves you, but he won't save you. And some people get into struggling 
Most of it is in the church, struggling, trying to overcome by religious efforts. It won't work. I said it won't work. If it would work, why don't you have the victory? Then some get in denial of self. Now, that's good. We're supposed to deny ourselves, take the cross, and follow, follow Christ. But denial of self is not enough to save you. All right, I'll do penance then. I'll punish myself because I'm no good. Satan, Satan agrees with you. And the Catholics are good about that. You know, doing penance, say a thousand Hail Marys, whatever. It won't save you. You can climb up on that telephone pole out there and stay there 30 days dressed in a white sheet. It won't save you. Punishing yourself won't save you. Like this one uh, Catholic I heard about. He punished himself, uh, wouldn't eat, and starved himself down and crawl up the steps. He wouldn't walk up the steps. And he, uh, he went on for several weeks. And he was asked, sir, are you, are you closer to God now by doing these things? And he said, I don't even know if there is a God. Now, folks, that's sad. I assure you there is a God that created everything that is. Not sin, didn't create the devil. But all good things he created in the beginning, perfect. We're the ones that messed it up. Then we got people in church, I'm going to overcome by a mere willpower. I want to remind you, willpower will not save you or give you the victory. It might help a little bit, but it's not enough to put you over the fence. Then we get into, well, I'll get knowledge. All right? I'll gain knowledge. I'll get degrees, this and that but it won't save you. <laughs> now, there's no excuse for ignorance. But if you're going to gloat in your degrees, that's pride. So we're told by supposed people that know, well, you've got to try harder to get the victory. Trying harder will not give you the victory. Well, we're told by many ministers, well, you need to pray more. That'll give you the victory. But it won't. I said it won't. Because you're trusting in prayer rather than in person. Now, I'm not saying prayer is wrong, but I'm saying if you're trusting in prayer for the victory rather than Jesus, it's wrong. Well, some say, well, I'm going to fast then. We've got this guy on TV. He fasts 21 days. Daniel's fast. Fast. And that gives him the victory, but it doesn't. And if fasting would give you the victory, then why do you need faith in Jesus for? Right. Yes. Now, it's not wrong to fast. We should fast. Hey, Amen. Let me, let me suck this in here. We should fast more, but it won't give you the victory. You try to make God do something he's already done, it won't work. All fasting does is get the flesh out of the way. Right. Yes. See? The flesh is our problem. Well, some say, well, I'll get saved and I'll get the victory. I'll just live in the church. I'll just stay here. Live in the church. It won't give you the victory. No. I know what I'll do. I'll memorize scripture. Oh, yeah. When I started in ministry, I could quote a hundred scriptures. Bam, bam, bam. Can't do it now because... Uh, well, we don't, if you don't keep doing it, then it kind of slips. It's there. Don't worry about it. But memorizing 100 scriptures before you started preaching will not give you the victory or the anointing. <laughs> Won't save you. A devil can quote the scripture. The last one. Well, I'll confess then. I'll confess my way to salvation. I'll confess my way to victory. I'll confess my way to deliverance, and, and the anointing will come then. But it won't. You know why? Because you're trusting something you can do rather than what's been done, which is iniquity. Now, say amen, somebody. Out. You know, really, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. Going to get straightened out this year and live right. Yeah. Amen. I'm trying to be nice, but I'm hitting snakes here, so just take your medicine today. Now, in regards to communion. First Corinthians 5, 7. That's enough hoe in the garden today. 
Amen. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What do you say? Can we do that today? We must do that today. Amen. Purge out there for the old leaven, that it may be a new lump, and you are unleaven, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So today as we approach the table of the Lord, we don't bring a sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice. We don't sacrifice the Lord every time we receive communion. No, he was sacrificed once for all. Amen. Amen. But the fact is that God gave the sacrifice for us. We didn't do it. The animal sacrifices were not good enough. And so God had to give a sacrifice, even his own son. You know this account. So communion, the memorial of Christ's death, a partaking of symbols and emblems, these are not literal. Representing the sinless blood and body of our Lord Jesus, taken for the realization of a spiritual union between Jesus and the partaker, or the partakers, you and me. So we have to trust Jesus in faith. That's what I'm talking about today. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2, Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore, talking to Christians, we are justified by faith. How are we justified? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's good news because the world's heading to hell fast and we need peace whom also we have access by faith. Look at this. We have access by faith into this grace. Now, not everyone's in grace. Only those that are born again are in grace. Grace is available to everyone, but they must come God's way. And that way is the cross. There is no other way to be accepted by the Father. Jesus said if someone tried to come up another way, they're the same as a thief and a robber. That pushes out all of the religions of the world. I'm sorry. The cross is the only way to be saved. Or stay saved. So we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Then drop down to verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. How are we justified? The blood of the Lamb. Our faith must be in the sinless blood of the Lamb. What I'm saying is, Jesus had to spill his innocent, sinless blood on the cross so we could be forgiven. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, they would bring the sacrifices like Cain and Abel, and, and uh, if the, the sinning one brought a sacrifice and they looked through the sacrifice to the coming Savior, God would accept them. Amen. God would look back through the sacrifice and accept the person that brought the sacrifice because their faith was in the coming Messiah the Savior. Likewise, in reverse, we just look back. Yep. See, we don't have to bring an animal. Jesus was our sacrifice, and God gave him for us so we could receive the atonement. Amen. Amen. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son, verse 10, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Praise God. He made atonement for you and me. Right. He reconciled us. He paid the ransom so that we could be made right with God. That's what's wrong with people in this world that we're living in. They don't know God. They're empty. They're looking for something, and it's not in the world. Amen. It came from another realm. Praise God but it's available today to all those that will believe. But it's, it's imperative you believe in the right thing and the right one. Are you believing is in vain. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It's imperative that our believer is believing correctly. <laughs> Amen. The only way we know is the Word of God. So then... In Exodus chapter 12 and verse uh, 12 and 13, all right, we're doing okay, I guess. You all know this account in the book of Exodus. 
uh, when God was going to send the death angel. Who's the death angel? I don't know. But he's, he was sent. He said, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be <clears throat> to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, that we sing that song, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Amen. So it's imperative that we're under the blood of Christ and washed by the blood. Now, in the Old Testament, they were not washed by the blood. They were under the blood from year to year. But when Christ came, he paid the price for all those that will believe past, present, and future. I'm not sure if Christ died for everyone, but I do know he died for all those that will believe. Amen. How many have believed? Amen. How many have believed? Amen. Then you're included in the provisions of Christ. And God didn't pick and choose. It was up to you to choose. But apparently he knew you would choose. That's why Jesus was compelled to go all the way. Because he knew you and me would accept him. Amen. So then, in communion, we simply applied the blood... And we receive the emblems of the blood in complete confidence. Amen. So we have the sin offering and the trespass offering. I talk about this quite a bit because Jesus was both. He was our sin offering and our trespass offering. Amen. Amen. For example, the sin offering removed the barrier caused by the sin. Now, I want to clarify this. Because many churches think we're just sinners, we can't help it. No, we were sinners before we were saved, but now we're called Christians. I'm not saying we're sinless in view of the fact that we all have the sin nature, and Jesus was the sin offering for our sin nature. In other words, the sin nature that separates uh, man is in every person, right. every man, every woman, every child above the age of accountability has to deal with this. And you cannot remove it. Right. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yep. You can confess you're blue in the face, and that sin nature is still there. It's reckoned dead. It's reckoned dormant. Yep. Are you dead to it? Or is it dead to you? Which one? Let somebody cross you, and we'll see how dead to self you are. Amen. So we have this situation to deal with. It shouldn't give us any trouble ever if we have faith and grace plus nothing. When we start trusting anything other than that, then the sin next is going to give us a problem. This is why Jesus had to come, number one, to be our sin offering, to remove the barrier that was caused by the sin nature that we got from Adam. I know some of you think you're perfectly sinless. You're wrong. That's right. I said you're wrong. That's right. Now go ahead and find a church that's holy if you want to. But I'm telling you what, we all got this to deal with. Right. And it came up in my life last year, and you made me madder than a... <laughs> I get over it quick. Now I know I don't upset anybody here. No, no, uh -uh. Sometimes you hate me, don't you? Don't you lie. But you're commanded to love. If you don't love, it's a sin nature. <laughs> then we receive that sin nature from Adam. It indwells every believer, every person. But the good news is it will be permanently removed at the rapture. Praise God. There'll be no more trouble then from the old man. Until then, we all need the Savior. We understand that, don't we? Some of you don't think you have the sin nature. You better read 1 John. If we say we have 
No sin nature, we lie. The truth's not in us. Folks, if I can make you all mad today, it's a proof you have the sin nature. And I'm trying real hard. Because some of you are mean, hellcat, evil. You lie, you cheat. You won't cook the husband anything to eat. You kick the dog. You curse. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. You play cards and cheat. You play bingo. Please don't play bingo, Barry. Don't. No. I'm not going to go to the restaurant and play bingo. You hear what I'm saying? That's my confession. I don't like bingo. We went to a little reunion of my wife over in the Washburn. Anybody know where Washburn, Missouri is? Washburn? I feel sorry for you, but they ran out of things to do there at that little old school gathering. They wanted to play bingo. They asked me if it's okay to play bingo. I don't care if you play bingo. I just can't take that bingo. I just can't take that. Got to get out of there. It's just me. It's just sitting there you're working. <laughs> Christ has got us covered for that, folks. Amen. Everybody tell, amen. Thank God. But the second one is a trespass offering. So Jesus is also our trespass offering today. And this involves being atoned for acts of sin. You see, the church has been wrong in preaching against sinning when sinning wasn't the problem, it was what caused the person to sin. That was the problem. And the church didn't have any answer. There's only one answer, and that's the cross. There is no other answer. You can get counseling till you're blue in the face, and it will not give you a victory till you get prayed to except Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's it, period. You got to repent of your sins. Amen. And let the Lord, through His grace and love, Wash you with his precious blood and make you a new person in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away and all things become new. Yeah. Amen. You're to walk in newness of life the very moment you receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Yes. Why aren't you? Because you're trying to do it without him. You cannot. We cannot live for God without the Holy Spirit. Not possible. Right. Yeah, we got churches that don't want the Holy Spirit. I try to try to keep the Holy Spirit in the congregation. Yeah. Right. But the way some of you fight like cats and dogs, you're going to come together and we're going to worship God in the Spirit? When you've had Christmas mall syndrome, family feud, huh? Upset because you didn't get the present you're supposed to get? What do you mean the acts of sin? Well, Galatians chapter 5. Do you know what the works of flesh are? I guess they better read it, Ben, so everybody's mad at me. I can't help it. Acts chapter, uh, Galatians 5, verse 19. This is why Jesus had to come. This is why Jesus came, is to forgive us the works of the flesh. Now, I'm talking to Christians. The reason Christians sin is because the sin nature is out of control. It must be crucified. But you can't do it on your own. You've got to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You've got to give up and let God have control of your life. Are the struggling sinning? Trying to help God. The works of flesh are manifested are these. Notice he starts off with adultery. Listen, he's writing to the church. I said Paul is writing to the church under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. The works of flesh, adultery. You know what that means? And then fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, immolation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. 
of the which I tell you before I have also told you in times past that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Church, if you live this way, and I'm not throwing rocks and stones. It's a warning. If you live this way and you say you're a child of God, you're taking the name of God in vain by telling people you're a Christian and you're living like hell on the earth, you're not going to make it to heaven. That's what Paul said. Now wake up. When I went to the promise keepers before they rejected the Holy Ghost, you heard me right. Those men were ready to receive the Holy Ghost, and they backed off and got scared because the ghost is going to get them. Well, but when they were going good, the promise keepers, they were going good, and those guys were preaching on men having spare ribs. There is no spare ribs. You'll get it in a minute. Eve was taken from Adam's rib. And they were leaving those services. Some of you were with me, and we went up there years ago. Those guys were going to the phone. Back then, didn't have a cell phone. They went to pay phone, and they were calling their mistress and their girlfriends and breaking it off and cutting it off. I'm staying with my wife. That's revival. I said, that's revival. Because they realized they weren't going to make it to heaven if they didn't get straightened up. This is holiness. Don't tell me you can live that way and get to heaven. You've came too late. You see, we've got to deal with these things, and we can't. Jesus dealt with them for us. I said Jesus dealt with them for us to help us because we can't overcome it without him. Boy, oh, boy. Glad I'm not preaching tonight. You see, folks, the cross was necessary, and Christ had to become the sin offering and our trespass offering at the same time. Amen. The sin offering deals, now listen to this, the sin offering deals with our condition, our struggling to do right. That's what it is. Because we can't do right without him. While the trespass offering deals with our acts of sinning, doing wrong. So I can't do right and I can't do wrong. What am I going to do? I have to trust God. <laughs> Who are you trusting in? You trusting in your church attendance? You trusting in your membership? You trusting in your ability to get a lot of money? Are you trusting in, you know, your good works? What are you trusting in? If you're trusting in anything that Christ crucified, you're wrong. Am I making myself clear? I hope so, because some of you this year, you're going to be tested. And God help us all. Because all of us are vulnerable to a snare of Satan. Especially preachers, man. You, you think you got it rough? Hey, you get on the front lines, you're going to find out. If we don't have the prayers of saints to support us and back us up and, and hold us up, you know, we're vulnerable. I said we're vulnerable. Your pastor is not Superman. No, I'll admit that. I'm the least of the saints. I'll admit that. I don't know anything. No. I've learned enough to know that I don't know anything. Somebody else can do the teaching and the preaching. See, spiritual pride is one of the worst things. It's the work of the flesh. Be careful, you theologians, because sin knows no boundaries. When you give a little crack in your armor here, it'll come in. And it'll, it'll trip you up, and your anointing's gone. So Jesus had to come and deal with our wrongdoing and our struggling and all this. The first problem was an indwelling problem, while the second acts out the problem with no remedy on man's part. Let me read it again. The first problem is an indwelt problem that Christ uh, made provisions for. While the second problem acts out the first problem. Well, sinners sin because they sin. There's, there's no reason for any of us Christians to ever sin again, period. Unfortunately, we probably will. 
What is sin? All unrighteousness. <laughs> You're condemning me. No, it's time to take inventory before we receive communion. And I'm going to read to you why right now. Would that be okay? Well, I don't feel, uh, well, yeah, you do. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 53 and verse 6. I'm going to have to quit before I get stoned today. All. Everybody say all. all. Now notice the prophet includes himself. Who are we to think we're so holy in our nose up in the air looking down upon the poor Republicans, huh? You'll get it in a minute. You know the word. The publican and the rich man, the Pharisee. Get it? Such a good mood today. Well, <laughs> last year's gone, everybody. Forget it. I'm done. Hallelujah. I'm done. All we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep are so stupid. The only animal more stupid is a turkey. My dad raised turkeys when I was a kid. Out on the range, 10,000 turkeys. They would drown themselves pecking the rain. They would drown themselves. That's stupid. All right, if you didn't go out and pick the dead turkeys up every day, anybody hungry yet? Pick the dead turkeys up, maggots would get in there, and one of those turkeys come along, eat a maggot, it would die. That's stupid. You know what? So I'm glad we're called sheep and not turkeys, because I tell you. All we're like sheep had gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way. Yeah, we're doing our own thing, yeah. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. There, God. God laid all of it on his son for us so he wouldn't have to put us in hell. So he could call us his sons and make us his sons. He could beget us with the word of truth. He could give us the indwelt Holy Spirit, eternal life, sonship for all eternity. On and on we can go. But Jesus had an awful weight on his shoulders. Terrible. We don't understand it all. But I'll tell you in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, down verse 23. I want to read this to you and let the scripture just talk to us today. And didn't need any commenting from me. Hallelujah. Let me find it here. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. There it is. I'm going to just read this to you, and I want you to analyze yourself, okay? Now, before we read this, prepare to receive communion today. This is serious. Water baptism and communion, two ordinances of the church, not optional. Won't save you, but it certainly identifies with the covenant that we're in. It's a blood covenant. Amen. You understand that? Now, most of the church, are you measuring up? Is there sin in your life? Well, the sin nature is there. Are you committing acts of sin? I repent. I repent of all sins I've committed if I know about it, and I don't know about it before I ever approach the table. I'm telling you right now. You do the same, please. Because God knows. Don't hide. Take the fig leaf off. But religion says, now go back here to the Ark of the Covenant, and you lift up that lid. Look at them broken commandments. Have you measured up? <laughs> Are you measured up, those Ten Commandments? You don't have to. We don't want to break them. Should I... Break them because I'm in grace? No. God will help us not to break those commandments, but we're not under the commandments. We're under grace. They're there to nail our hide to the wall if we break them, but you don't have to. Here's a good deal about this, this communion now. That lid on the mercy seat was closed, and the blood was put on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? So when God came down... He looked at the blood. He didn't open up the lid and look at the broken commandments that we've all broken. This is the deal. 
Praise God. I said, this is the deal. It's almost too good. Well, it is the gospel. It's the blood that makes a difference. Christ was the ark. He fulfilled the commandments for us. His blood speaks to God today, right now, fresh. Amen. And when we partake communion, amen, we're saying, Lord, thank you for the blood of the lambs on my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's it, period. Amen. Not optional. We'll do what's right with the Lord's help. Amen. Now, here's what Paul said. I have received the commandment of the Lord delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. This in remembrance of me. Now, there was no bone broken, you understand. The same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, he said, This cup is New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. There's no set way. Some churches do it every Sunday, and some, you know, uh, there's no set rule. But he said in verse 26, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. So we're, we're, we're expressing faith in the Lord's death on the cross until the rapture. Amen. Wherefore, whose service shall eat this bread, drink this cup unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Amen. It's not your worthiness, it's his. Because none of us can actually measure up like Jesus. Period. And so that's why we need him. That's why he came. But let a man examine himself. 27, I'm sorry. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty in the body and blood of the Lord. And let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. So if you're in faith and grace and you're you acknowledge the fact that your sin nature is crucified. You acknowledge the fact you don't want to commit any more sins, and you've repented of sins you have committed. Jesus has got us covered. All minor sins forgivable except blaspheme. Amen. All you have to do is say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Help me not do it again. I repent. That's the covenant. If you try to overcome the problem any other way, it won't work. But let a man examine himself. So that's what we're going to do today. We're examining ourselves, right? So let him eat that bread and drink that cup. There's no condemnation. So uh, gladly do it because your name's in the book of life. Gladly approach the, the, the table of the Lord. And then he gives a warning. He that eats us and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we don't discern the Lord's body on the cross and we don't discern the church. The church is the Lord's body, the real church. If you're born again, I must accept you as a brother and sister in the Lord. We don't have to agree on everything, but we've got to agree on the essentials of salvation. We have to. Of course, I include the Holy Ghost in that, because without Him, we can't be saved to start with. You know, that's the better preaching of amens I'm getting. I don't know. We're starting off the year kind of rough here. Then he gives this warning. For you don't discern the Lord's body. Many are weak and sick, and some are dead. How many want to be healed? Only one, two? We all need something, don't we? Then we need to acknowledge the fact that healing comes through the cross by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we exercise faith, and what we're going to do today is exercise faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus individually here as we partake the emblems and symbols of the Lord's body. The wine represents his blood, and the, the bread represents his body, which was given on the cross for us so that we could be saved. Let's wait just a minute. Father God, I've delivered my soul here now. 
than the best I could to explain this. We know there's always sin around. We know that. But God, you love us. We ask that you would help us, Father, to overcome the things that's not pleasing to you. We all have issues. We don't throw stones. We're one. We uphold those that are weak in the faith today. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would forgive everyone. As we ask forgiveness from you, we confess our wrongdoing silently or whatever. But Father God, you said you'd, do, you'd forgive us, and we take you at your word. And now we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and we have a fresh start today, and we're going to prove that we trust you by receiving this communion. And we look back to the shed blood and body of Christ on the cross. We remember his death till he comes again, Father. Thank you for the salvation of our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>